Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's uh, attending my uh, workshop here. I appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, today we're talking about the physiology of audiovisual entrainment. So here we go. Let's get rolling. We have a little disclaimer, courtesy of the legal department. <clears throat> so what happens when you take light and you strobe it and you flash it? That's what we'll be talking about. What happens when you take a tone, like a bum, and you break it up into pulses, like bop, 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 bop. Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And a little bit of history of audiovisual entrainment. Adrian and Matthews were the first to discover that flickering lights could drive a burger rhythm. Burger rhythm was the alpha rhythm that was named after Hans Berger, who discovered it in 1928 or so. And they could drive it up and down from its natural frequency of 10 hertz. And uh, so this, this is where the concept of entrainment came from. So oh. in the 30s and 40s, there were thousands of studies done on stimulus in, blinking lights in, or pulsing tones in, or tactile, you know, or tapping in, brain waves out. And, uh, <clears throat> and that was nice in its own right, but it didn't say too much about clinically, like how would it affect people clinically? And then Kroger and a few other people too, uh, W. Gray Walters did a lot of subjective experience work with audiovisual entrainment and strobes, uh, but William Kroger did some interesting things. He was a physician with the US military and it was his job to find out how come uh, during the Second World War, Americans were driving their battleships into enemy territory and driving and uh, flying bomber planes into em enemy territory. And suddenly they were getting shot at and it was clear on the radar that there was enemy oh, all around. Them. He's These old fashioned radars didn't hold the image on the screen. This, this is a time-lapse photo here of several seconds. Uh, but the old radars did not hold an image on the screen. So when the, when the wiper were swept around the screen, you'd see a white blip showing up every time there was something there. And it was this flashing of this white blip uh, that was in part dissociating and or entraining radar operators to get into a trance state. And it was probably more dissociating than anything. And they would just watch the enemy come on screen and uh, did nothing about it because they were all tranced out. So that was an important big step through about entrainment. And here was the next big step. So uh, Kroger, recognizing the dissociative aspects, like in a dissociation in a meditative sort of way, uh, recognizing those dissociative aspects of entrainment and how that could be used clinically in therapy, he teamed up with uh, Sidney Schneider of the Schneider Instrument Company out of Ohio. And, and in 1958, they released uh, the Brainwave Synchronizer and uh, you can see those dials for delta, alpha, beta uh, ranges, and so on. This is mine, and uh, you can see it's got an orangey light, and that's because the, the original models had a neon light, and that's why it's orangey looking. Uh, they went to a xenon strobe later on. A lot of research has been done on entrainment. Like I say, these are not including, uh, these are all clinical studies that have been done. Um, these are not including all the physiological studies, which are in, many, many hundreds, if not thousands at this point in time. And, uh, and I, I've only updated this to 2010 or so, but when we get into all the, uh, the research, the clinical research, which we'll be doing in, in subsequent webinars, I'll, I'll cover all the research right up to the latest and greatest. <clears throat> this is when I got involved and I had hair. And um, before I went bald, uh, things can get pretty stressful in the relaxation business is what I always like to say. And you can lose your hair in the process. But as it is, all my uncles and my mother's side are bald, so it's probably genetic. So anyway, it was 1984, and I was working at the University of Alberta doing temporomandibular dysfunction research, TMD, or what they call TMJ research, temporomandibular joint research. Um, and, um, and in 1984, in the summer of 84, uh, a, a, an instructor in performing arts who had heard of audiovisual entrainment, he had heard of this device, the brainwave synchronizer and some other things that were out there. <clears throat> he asked me if I could design him a device so that his students uh, could overcome stage fright. That was his intention to use it for. And I just 
love brain stuff. I love physiology, generally speaking. Um, I love electronics design. I love physics. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And off I went. And it took me almost a year. I didn't complete it until June, July of 85. And here's what it looked like here. That's the David one. Uh, I was going to call it a neurostim or, you know, some kind of a brainwave synchronizer name, a techie kind of a name. <clears throat> but he called it, uh, uh, he wanted to call it the David one in, in sort of honor for me because at the end of it all, I made a dollar an hour. And that's all I made on, on, on the design of this machine. The original one. Fortunately, I made two and I kept one for myself. And uh, so anyway, he wanted to honor me for the fact that I was working for a dollar an hour. And he came up with David. I'm like, well, gee, that's nothing. I mean, that's not honor at all. Let's go back to Neurostim. He said, no, no, no. Digital audio visual integration device. Integrating brain waves with digital audio visual stimulation. Spells David. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, I guess we can go with that. It was, he was paying for it, I guess. Even though it was a dollar an hour, he was paying for it. Uh, so we went with the David name. I was going to change it later, but then we started becoming, uh, the David name became, was becoming popular and several magazines had written articles on it. And so we figured we should just keep the David name. I kind of changed my name to Dave um, and, uh, uh, and so on. So anyway, that's why it has the David name on it. And we, we use that name to this day. <clears throat> We've made quite a few devices since then of all sorts. Uh, we're up in summers around now and uh, well over 50,000 devices made since the inception of my of Mind Alive. We made David Juniors, Junior Pluses. We made Paradises for a long time. Uh, 15 years we had a Paradise line running. And that's interesting in itself because um, Archie actually did a little comic on Paradise and he actually used the word. Paradise. Well, this well, Veronica has the uh, device on her head, so uh, that was kind of cute. Um, we're working on the Delight line now. That's what we've been running since about 2012. Is the Delight line at this point in time? And we now our latest device is the Spectrum, which runs off of USB port off of, uh, off of any Windows 10 computer, and it works ex extremely well. It generates a million colors, <clears throat> frequencies up to. Uh, over 50 hertz, and, uh, and it works with a breathing app that is remarkable for heart rate variability. So that's our latest device so far. All kinds of machines spun out in the 70s and 80s, and there's still people generating machines um, uh, all over the place. At least 40 companies have gone, come and gone, maybe more at this point. A lot of devices have come and gone. And, and, and the, I think the biggest reason for that is that a lot of people can, can imagine building blinking lights in their basement. It's not hard to do, but to do good quality uh, blinking uh, or audio visual entrainment is very difficult. It takes a huge amount of work to do good quality uh, uh, stimulation. And, um, um, and I think that's why, and also the science behind it is getting a very complex as well. And I think that's probably why so many companies have come and gone because they don't address that. <clears throat> okay, so let's get into what is audiovisual entrainment. Here we go. Well, with entrainment, uh, you can do all kinds of things. You can adjust frequency of the brain waves, which Adrian and Matthews found out. You can dissociate people in a meditative kind of way. Uh, you, it, it's very effective of breaking the HPA or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So when people have flight or fight, you can calm people very, very rapidly on audiovisual entrainment. It increases cerebral blood flow quite remarkably and lactate and anaerobic ATP. It balances neurotransmitters. It excites neurons and glia. It increases heat shock protein 70, which is important. And a recent study just came out where it activates uh, specific cytokines. And I don't have the slide on that study yet. It's a very, very complex study, and I don't know a lot about cytokines. Um, so I'm still learning uh, about what that means. But as you can see, even though the concept of brainwave entrainment really implies frequency, frequency is just a small, small amount of what entrainment does. And there are times you don't have to use the, the so called correct frequency from a neurofeedback model at all, and you still get remarkable results. So, <clears throat> difference between audiovisual entrainment and audiovisual stimulation. 
Watching TV is audiovisual stimulation. I don't think though there are very many mental health benefits from watching TV. Uh, I mean, a good sitcom is not a bad way to uh, de-stress from the COVID, vi uh, the COVID virus, but, but that's still not from the stimulation per se. You could read a book and do that. Um, an exact frequency produced definitely is audiovisual entrainment when you're flashing at an exact frequency. <clears throat> but we did a study uh, many years back with uh, a group of psychologists in the United States and we were experimenting with randomization to see if random, if, if taking entrainment, but making it complex stimulation through complete randomization would be more effective than just a fixed frequency. Now in the old days on those paradise devices, we had 40 protocols in those devices at all kinds of frequencies. And once we randomized, we were able to knock those 40 really down to about 10. And uh, even those 10, we have just longer and shorter versions of basically the same protocol. Uh, but we could really knock them down and, uh, and they were yeah, actually considerably more effective than a fixed frequency. So we found that randomizing up to plus or minus one hertz, it's still in training. You don't, it's not a, as strong a signature on an EEG, um, but on a quantitative EEG, it certainly shows up very well. You know, like an EEG over time, <clears throat> it definitely shows up. Uh, very well, but on a, a, but individual brain waves, you don't—they're not that strong anymore when you randomize it. Randomizing plus or minus two hertz isn't very effective clinically anymore. And when you randomize it plus or minus three hertz, there's basically no clinical effect at all. <clears throat> so we've randomized too far. I mean, plus or minus three hertz. If you were at, let's see, you were stimulating at ten. Well, that would be now between seven and thirteen, and it just doesn't seem to work. But nine to 11 stimulation works extremely well and, uh, and, and far better than a fixed frequency. So we randomize all of our, uh, all of our protocols pretty much. Now entrainment relies on the thalamus to get into the brain. Uh, the entire brain is innervated to the thalamus and that's where our alpha waves, theta waves and delta waves come from is the thalamocortical loop that is bouncing back and forth. Typically once we close our eyes, or if we're very relaxed or meditating and so on, then the thalamal, thalamal cortical loop engages, and that's your alpha waves. And as you get drowsier, they become theta waves. And if you fall asleep, they become delta waves as the thalamus hyperpolarizes. All of our senses, except smell, run through the thalamus. So uh, there have been all kinds of studies on, see, on, on, on audio, on visual, and tactile stimulation showing uh, entrained uh, frequencies in the brain from stimulation. In the case of audio, we've got a sound here, in this case presented at the, uh, in the cochlea of the ear, where, where sounds are perceived, runs into uh, this nucleus in the olivary body, up into the medial geniculate, up into the temporal lobes, and actually on both sides, and the tones are displayed in the temporal lobes, but the medial geniculate activates the thalamus, and, and in the process, it also then excites its rhythm into the entire cortex. <clears throat> Here's an example of a pulse tone. So this tone is bum, like an oscilloscope tracing. There's an evoke potential in the auditory cortex shortly thereafter, and another small evoke potential when the tone turns off. And uh, that's an example here. Uh, okay. If you break up the tones into pop, 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 pop sounds, we can also do alternate. We can also do dual frequencies, which gets much more complex. And uh, that's what it looks like on an oscilloscope. If you look at our pulse tones or isochronic tones, they're like a pop, 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 sound, and that's what they look like uh, on, uh, on an oscilloscope. <clears throat> now, monro beats are also used. Monro beats drive the thalamus. They're a real beat. And the easiest way to make a monro beat is to have two oscillators. So one, it's, this is just an example, 170 hertz. It's kind of like bomb. 170 would be bomb, a little higher pitch. You have two speakers in the room and the, they will blend in the room, and then you hear this woo, 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 woo effect, which drives the thalamus and will therefore entrain your brain. Those of you who've ever tuned stringed instruments like, uh, like guitars or cellos, and when you're trying to tune um, uh, two strings together, and you, have, you listen for that beat when you're tuning it. So when I'm tuning a string on the guitar, for instance, I get this woo, 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 woo effect, and I'll just adjust the string a little bit till the beat goes away, then I know I'm exactly tuned uh, to the other strings. 
You can also make monorail beats by, uh, by taking two different oscillators, again, putting them into an audio mixer, having the pan in the middle so it mixes electronically within the mixer, uh, and then you get beats into your headphones. This is what, again, what um, monorail beats look like. And you can see uh, one beat is a little faster than the other, and it's just vector addition. You can see here this, this um, wavelet is upwards, this other wavelet is downwards, so they cancel each other out and they give you zero. Here, both wavelets are going up, so you have a really strong positive peak. Here, both wavelets are negative, and you have a very strong negative peak. And they just go in and out of phase because they're slightly different frequencies. And uh, that's just how monorail beats works. Now, binaural beats are similar, except binaural beats isolate the tones to each ear. Now, what that means is each ear hears a steady tone, just a bomb, and that's it. So there's no pulsing into the cochlea, and if there's no pulsing into the eardrum and cochlea, you will not get excitation of the thalamus. And binaural beats have shown that there's almost no entrainment off a of binaural beat, all very close to zero. There's a little bit, but not much. Uh, so binaural beats are actually a perception on uh, their, their phase sensitive circuits that help us determine where a sound is located. So partly when it's, we hear a sound, it hits one ear slightly ahead of the other. And that difference in phase, because it'll uh, be a little phase difference there, will helps us to determine where a sound is. And so basically the, the perception we hear with binaural beats, the woo 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 effect is, is really caused by phase perception circuits and not by driving, uh, not act, not, it's not a real sound. It's a perceived sound. It does not drive the thalamus really to speak of much at all. So here's the perception of binaural beats. And they're not nearly as pronounced as isochronic tones or monaural beats. They're quite mild. Uh, 6 dB difference actually between high and low, which isn't very much. If you look at this on an on a, on a MEG plot, we can see uh, binaural beats do have a little bit of an effect on the brain, and monaural beats have a large effect on the brain. Now, visual stimulation. Uh, visual stimulation, this is the world's biggest entrainment device, and we call it a highway. And have you heard of highway hypnosis, where people go into a trance, often they'll go into a theta state, and or fall asleep and drive into the ditch, perhaps. Um, they might go into a theta state and see a pink elephant on their highway, um, or something like this. So I've measured this in Europe, in the US, in Australia, and in Canada. And at 100 kilometers an hour, or 60 miles an hour, the lines go by at about six lines per second. So if it's dark out at night um, and you're a little bit sleepy anyway, which helps, and then the lines further entrain you into a theta state. And uh, sometimes though, once people are in a theta state, they will fall asleep and uh, then you'll have an accident on the highway. Uh, even in a theta state, you could, probably, you could likely have an accident because you're very, very drowsy in a theta state. So that's highway hypnosis. But if you took a highway and you contained it into a box, and you could do this and have the similar effect. So if we had a, a big, big light in a room, let's say, uh, or a, a light that lit up an entire eye set <clears throat> flashing into the eyes, uh, you would hit uh, both retinas on both eyes. You'd have a big evoke potential coming out. Now, there's typically there's a 100 millisecond delay between the flash onset and the actual evoke potential in the brain. And so uh, it, it works up to 10 hertz, which is typically where people's natural alpha resides. But if your alpha was slowed, as it is in Alzheimer's, you'll see the actual peak of photic driving to be more around 8 hertz, and so on. <clears throat> Here's a study done by Kinney using a strobe light. Uh, again, it's a square wave strobe light, and square waves make harmonics, which we'll see. And they're flashing this onto uh, a screen. And... Uh, the x-axis on the bottom here is one second across. So here they're flashing at two flashes per second. So there's a flash, here's your 100 millisecond delay. That's the evoke potential right there in the brain. Another flash right about here at the 500 millisecond mark, there's the evoke potential. At four flashes per second though, we're starting to see a four hertz wave. There's some harmonics in there. There'll be odd harmonics like 12 and, uh, and maybe eight and 12 in this. Uh, at eight flashes per second, we're much pure. We still have harmonics that show up as a result of using a square wave. And surprisingly, um, uh, 12 flashes per second was surprisingly clean. Because often, 
again, you will see harmonics. And this is a particularly clean recording, uh, typically with a square wave, uh, like a xenon strobe light, which is instant on and instant off. That's, that's what a square wave is. Uh, you will typically see harmonics show up. And here's 20 hertz at the bottom. So that's an example of driving it from a frequency perspective with very bright lights, 50,000 lux and a square wave. This study was done by John Frederick, and uh, he was a, a doctoral student with uh, Lubar's group. And they looked at a square wave at 18 hertz using uh, wearing an eye set from a little uh, audiovisual device. And they noted that photic entrainment at 18 and a half hertz increased the EG by 49% at the vertex at top, at CZ or CZ. Um, I'm translating for the Americans. Uh, eyes closed, audio entrainment increased the EG by 21 and eyes open, increased it by 27%. We use this one a lot for all frequencies in the SMR band, like about 12 Hertz and upward, because it's a little more aggressive than just a sine wave, but we don't use square waves in our gear at all. You can program them in, but we don't use them. So what this is, this is still a sine wave that comes up, but then it holds a little bit, stays on for a little bit of time, then it drifts off and then it holds a little bit at the bottom. So it's sine-ish, uh, and it's also a little bit, it's also partially square because of the fact that we hold the light on and off a little bit on each, at, each half of the cycle. And it typically generates a second harmonic when we do that. And I like that for cognition. I, I think it works better for cognition than just a simple sine wave, but it's not nearly as aggressive as a square wave, which causes problems of its own. So here's an example now of a person flashing at eight hertz. And we see with the distribution of power from lights and sounds at eight hertz. And that's a very nice distribution. And we see a second harmonic at 16 right here. Now here's an example using um, a sloping uh, stimulation. I was sloping the stimulation from 12 hertz to 15 over about a 10 minute period. And this person is quite deficit or quite deficient in the uh, SMR band, as we can see here. And, uh, 20 minutes later, this is the, uh, the end result. So you see the difference is dramatic. And it's, whoops, it's very fast. I mean, you could not, you could not achieve this with neurofeedback at all in a 30 minute session. Uh, so that's the difference there. Here's another study that was uh, published in 2018. And they were using uh, uh, the uh, delight, using theta as a way of enhancing memory. And uh, they were comparing it against white noise and also in one experiment, comparing it against 14 hertz in the other experiment. And we can see that in theta actually was better than using these other conditions. But they're showing the distribution in their study. They found the distribution of theta was, was largely in the frontal areas while they were doing this experiment. So it certainly gets into the cortex all over the place in treatment. <clears throat> Here's an example of square wave stimulation. And... Uh, Square stimulation generates all kinds of harmonics. I don't know of any other device on the market that, that makes sine waves. I don't use square waves. Every other product on the market pretty much that I know of uses square waves because they're so easy to make because port pins generate square waves. Ones and zeros are basically square waves when a port pin of a computer uh, switches between one and a zero. And, uh, and they make all kinds of harmonics. And where I see the biggest issues with square waves is when someone's trying to run 10 hertz to meditate, and then you get a 30 hertz wavelet, which is the third harmonic of a square wave, and then they all have an anxiety reaction or even sometimes panic reaction uh, because the square wave generated a much larger high beta component than the alpha component. Now, it's not very common you actually see this pattern, but you do see this pattern in anxious people who are low in alpha and high in beta they show this pattern very easily, and that's the worst kind of person to use a square wave on, is, are those types of people. So my rule of thumb is for everything 12 hertz and under, use a sine wave, and this is a sine wave here. It only makes the fundamental frequency, as you can see here, at 10, if you're, in this case, looks like we're flashing at nine hertz and, or thereabouts, you don't make any harmonics with the sine wave. Um, now, if you have, a, let's say, a, a stereo playing, and you're playing some nice music on your stereo. Uh, a lot of musical instruments, you know, uh, if they're non-electronic, at least they're non-distorted, like uh, will make sine waves, like cell, like stringed instruments make sine waves and stuff. Okay. If you took, if you had a cheap stereo and you cranked it up really loud, so it was all distorted and sounding just terribly, just dreadfully terrible. Uh, that's what happens when you square 
when you square audio signals um, and by turning up the stereo light, and it has a pretty grating sound on the nerves. Um, another thing about entrainment that's very interesting is that it has a tendency to inhibit the half frequency of stimulation. We've noted this for some time on our QEEGs. But Tom Kalira did a beautiful little, uh, he's with Brain Master. He's the owner of Brain Master. He did a nice little study using a single electrode over, uh, over, C, over FZ, showing that this, this uh, child, uh, this boy, young boy, who was uh, highly ADHD, this theta is extremely high. This is theta, very high. He turned on the double frequency uh, at 14 hertz, and very quickly, we saw inhibition of all that theta. So we, we use this technique with, uh, with ADHD and, and cognitive decline in seniors and, and head injuries, concussions, where we give them SMR. So, um, so again, uh, what's beautiful about this, I'd say with ADHD, for instance, ADHD kids make high theta and they have low SMR in their motor strip. So if we give them 14 hertz photic stim, we can simultaneously inhibit the theta and bring up SMR at the same time. So you get both effects in one. And, that, and that, we rely on that all the time for a cognitive decline, say concussions, um, 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 ADHD, and we use it with depression a lot too, but we use alpha beta for depression uh, using split fields, which we'll show you in a bit here. And here are the split fields. <clears throat> We're the only company that uses split fields. And with split fields, uh, we put the stimulation on both lefts of one frequency and on the other frequency is both rights. And the reason why we do that is because unlike the right arm, you know, our right arm is tied to the left motor strip, sensory motor strip, and the left arm is, their left leg is tied to the right sensory motor strip, but the eyes don't work that way. In the case of eyes, the right visual fields of both eyes goes to the left side of the brain, and the left visual fields of both eyes go to the right side of the brain. This is really important evolutionary development because the left and right brain certainly process visual information very differently from each other. So if ever you lost an eye, you could lose half of your brain's processing. So by being wired this way, if you lose, a if you lose an eye, the other eye still uh, enters into both, is processed in both hemispheres. But we can do, do two different frequencies, like frequency A here and frequency B, and we can generate different frequencies in the brain. There is some spillover, a little bit of crossover uh, from off the ISIS, but it's not too bad. Now, on another aspect of entrainment is its ability to dissociate people. And those of you who use entrainment know that you go into a very deep trance very fast. So you have a brain that's all agitated, uh, full of noise and thoughts and, and distressing things. <clears throat> and typically within five to six minutes, it's completely silent and calm and you fall asleep. Uh, right now, there are clinicians uh, buying 20 and well, 10, 20 units at a time from us to do teletherapy with their patients um, because they can't see them in their office right now. And, uh, and they're using a lot of it to do with anxiety and especially virus based anxiety at the moment. Acute anxiety works extremely well for, and we sell a great deal of uh, our devices to uh, war vets, um, active soldiers, uh, first responders, and so on because they can dissociate right out of a distressful event and not develop PTSD. In the case of uh, war vets, typically they use it to treat PTSD and it works quite well. Breaks the HPA axis, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, all the original research uh, on entrainment that Kroger and Schneider were involved with was all about hypnotic induction. They didn't think of it as uh, meditation or dissociation in those days. So they all talked about hypnotic induction. And this was the first study, really, 1959. And they found that just using lights alone off of that synchro, the brainwave synchronizer, that 78% of people were in a, in a trance, in a hypnotic trance. And other studies on dentistry, on gastrointestinal surgery, and other things on hypnotic induction uh, were started emerging in the years that followed this study. So entrainment does a very good job of shutting down a racy head uh, very quickly. So what, what program, you just said it's really good for acute anxiety. What program would you start out with for acute anxiety? Uh, there is no particular program for acute anxiety, unfortunately. But here's what we're finding. I mean, generally speaking, we might use uh, Alpha or Schumann 
for acute anxiety. That's, that's pretty common. But the, I find that the more ramped up a person is, I mean, the more wound up they are, the faster the frequency I need to use to dissociate them out of their anxiety. And I've got cases on EEG where I've taken people with anxiety and I've put them on an alpha protocol and we've driven up their alpha some. But if I put them on, let's say, a randomized SMR beta, like a brain brightener, which is typically not used to generate alpha, but because they dissociate so deeply, just because the stimulation is so intense and overwhelming because it's so fast being randomized SMR beta, um, we have SMR on the, uh, on the um, left side stimulation and beta on the right side stimulation, and it's randomized. <clears throat> and uh, I'll put them on that, and their alpha will, will come up a lot higher than actually giving them alpha. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes down to the entrainment model of entrainment, the way we do it nowadays, because we're not using 50,000 lux high intensity uh, square wave strobe lights. I mean, our intent, most people are using our eye sets at about four, four to 500 lux, and then no brighter than that. We're typically, we never use a square wave, and we often use sine waves. So we are dissociating them through non, it's still entrainment, but it's not so much frequency driving entrainment. It's, it's doing other things to the brain, like lactate and super blood flow and dissociation and breaking the HPA axis just by its complexity. And as you know, when you look at complex forms, even of hypnosis, like Ericksonian hypnosis, where there's two stories presented simultaneously, one in each ear, uh, people fall into trance very fast because it just gets sensory overloaded by two stories at once. Um, so it, we use that effect, that dissociative effect, rather than the entrainment effect, and it generally works a fair bit better. Yeah, that was great, Dave. Thank you. You bet. Now, here's a study here done. Um, now, I should have mentioned that study there by Kroger and Schneider with hypnosis. They were using 10 hertz alpha. Uh, this one was done, though. This is complex stimulation off of a paradise where we're using something like uh, 9 hertz on one side and about 8, uh, or maybe we're using the Schumann on the other side. I can't remember what the frequencies were, but they were in the, the slow alpha band. <clears throat> and here they, um, this is out of the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, they did several studies uh, on our gear. And here they look like they compare lab laboratory induced entrainment. I mean, dissociation, because they work with dissociated, uh, they're dissociating people out of anxiety. And you can see the entrainment for high dissociators and low dissociators was more effective than the standard techniques that they use in psychology, which is dock staring and stimulus deprivation. So entrainment outperformed all of that. Then they did a follow up study <clears throat> and they took people who have dissociative anxiety. Now you work in psychology, of course, with special needs adults, and a lot of people, if they kind of lose track of what they're doing, they get really freaked out by it. And uh, so they looked at, he looked at a whole group here of 101 people who had dissociative anxiety. So if they're driving home and suddenly realized they don't remember part of the trip, and then they get all anxious about it, you probably see that more with type A people and people who have fears, uh, uh, fears of losing control and stuff, maybe from traumas and things. <clears throat> but anyway, he, he put them on the entrainment with the, uh, the Paradise device, and he had a little dissociation psychometric that they filled out. It was like a dozen questions or 15 questions. They filled it out before the session, then they ran the session for about 20 minutes, then they filled it out again. And you can see here that the dissociation doubled. And because these guys have dissociative anxiety, their anxiety doubled, as we can see down here. But if your anxiety doubles, what happens to your heart rate? Heart rate goes up. Heart rate went down. And that was a complete surprise that even though your, your, uh, your perception of anxiety or your perceived anxiety is going up, somatically or physiologically, you're actually, they were actually calming down. So he saw this was a great desensitization tool for people who had these anxiety disorders. And he was using it now to actually desensitize them. Uh, because sooner or later, the brain will catch up to what it's experiencing off the body. And if the body's getting very relaxed, uh, you will start to now lose that psychological attachment to being anxious. And you'll through afferents, and you'll start to relax more. <clears throat> now, here's a little something else. Uh, now that we talked about don't use it for seizures, but I'll show you. I use entrainment as a mini sleep lab all the time. And um, particularly people who've had childhood traumas, cortisol has damaged the brains, especially the temporal lobes and the amygdala, 
The amygdala loses its GABA receptors and the front, prefrontal lobes can no longer inhibit fear responses. So if you put them on an EEG, eyes closed, yeah, you just see your alpha spindles. You don't see anything important uh, with that population. But if you would train them and you knock them to sleep, then you see that they're seizing in their sleep. And these are all those trauma people, uh, which you've probably seen plenty of, Al, and, uh, and, and they have sleep seizures. And they wake up 100 times a night and they're exhausted all the time. And they're getting psychotherapy for their traumas, which sometimes can act, ex exacerbate their sleep seizures because it keeps the cortisol up. So I use entrainment to, to detect this and see if this is going on. And then because entrainment breaks the HPA axis so effectively, if, the, if, if a person with sleep seizures uses entrainment, typically in about two months, their seizures stop entirely. And they become completely normal after that and they get full night sleeps, which you need to function. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the hypothalamus. Of course, all of our autonomic functioning comes off the hypothalamus. And the whole hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which activates during flight or fight, of course, is part of that loop. Entrainment shuts down this loop typically uh, very effectively and shuts down cortisol. And that's why it works on those people who have sleep seizures and all kinds of other people, of course, who have stressors. So here's an example of a person who has uh, anxiety and they have really cold fingers because we vasoconstrict typically when we're anxious. And the dissociation that we saw in that hypnosis study by Kroger and Schneider, it really kicks in at about the five to six minute mark, uh, which interestingly is also when lactate and ATP really start to scoot up in the brain. So there might be a connection, but I'm not sure. But you can see at about six minutes, suddenly this person gets very warm hands. So I use it for finger training, temperature finger training on people with vascular, vasoconstrictive vascular headaches. And it works very well. Then they, they never fail <clears throat> if used in entrainment as an adjunct to biofeedback, uh, temperature biofeedback. This is skin conductance. So this is sweaty up here. And as a person suddenly starts to dissociate, their hands get drier um, down here, where this is where you would see typically see good meditators be when they're meditating. Uh, this is forearm EMG in a golfer who's really having struggling to golf because he's exhausting his fast twitch fibers, which you must have to have a good golf swing. And he's, so he's exhausting his fast twitch muscle fibers from psychological anxiety. And so when he goes out on the green to play, now he's trying to play with slow twitch fibers. Most golfers who use entrainment will gain uh, a distance of easy 30 yards on the driving range. And in metric, well, we'll call it 30 meters if they're close enough. Uh, so I've got golf testimonials of golfers driving straighter and farther after entrainment. So we can see this guy with all this forearm tension here and, and after entrainment at about six minutes, five, six minutes, he's very relaxed. And, and then his arm can recover. On the blood flow side, uh, Fox and Rakeley found that of all the frequencies of stimulation, entrainment has the highest effect on cerebral blood flow at 7.8 hertz which is interesting because that's the Schumann resonance of the earth. And because it breaks this HPA axis, it, it's remarkable how it works for uh, heart rate variability, biofeedback. And we're documenting more and more cases all the time now of people who cannot do heart rate variability biofeedback because the more anxious they are, the more being paced to breathe, having a breath pacer just stresses the daylights out of them. And this is a lady here who, uh, whose husband was into porn and molested some children. And uh, the police showed up at her door to arrest him. And she had no idea, of course. And, and it was just a mess. Uh, she moved away. Uh, he, was, he had a much better paying job. So he got a lawyer to take custody, week, uh, to get weekend custody of her two children, who also were six and eight years of age. And she had huge amounts of stress. So this is her trying to breathe at, at a 10 second heart rate variability breath. So. Uh, six breaths per minute, and you can see her heart rate is not showing that rhythm at all. This is a frightened animal in a cage kind of a heart rate. I call it spike and clamp. There's the spike, there's all the clamp, and there'll be another spike, and there's clamping. This is, a, this is an unhealthy state to be. Uh, I'll be doing my heart rate variability lecture in time here, and uh, it's showing that the loss of heart rate variability is, is a very positive indicator for death, for when you're going to die.
And uh, so it's important to have variability. Now, when you look at the spectrum, she's trying to breathe, of course, at 10 seconds per breath cycle, which would come out at 0.1 hertz, which is right here. She's got a little bit of that, but mostly she has a lot of sympathetic arousal. And parasympathetic tries to make up for it um, with higher frequencies. This is her score, and of course, no score at all. And uh, we can also see that her mean heart rate is 99 beats per minute. In terms of entrainment ratio, now this is entrainment ratio from breathing to heart rate. Again, she's doing a 10 second breathing cycle, so her heart should speed up and slow down in a rhythm over 10 seconds, and it's just not. Put her on entrainment, waited five minutes, started recording, gives us this beautiful heart rate variability, and that's the breaking of the HPA axis. This is a beautiful indicator of that. She had a few thoughts of her situation and her ex-husband at that point pop into her head because she, she came out of her dissociation a bit. So basically, she dissociated out of her fear. I call this DAR, dissociation and restabilization. When people dissociate out of all their anxieties, which entrainment does well, they, they, know, they basically stabilize again autonomically. So when she had a couple of thoughts creep in about her situation, you could see it eroded her score. But then she re-dissociated and her score continued to climb. And literally in the course of 20 minutes, her heart rate slowed from 99 to 77 beats per minute. And this is why entrainment is so good for acute anxieties and stuff. And it prevents further issues down the road. Now, on the blood flow side, <clears throat> Uh, I've had a lot of discussions with Herschel Tumim, and Herschel Tumim uh, was a wonderful old pioneer in biofeedback who had a hemoencephalography a device where he, he would measure, he, he did bio neurofeedback basically through brain blood flow. And there's all kinds of research showing that if you have hyperperfusion of cerebral blood flow, your brain slows down. And it's common in ADHD and, and dementia and stuff like this. So this lady here, she's in college and she's dropping out because she just can't focus. She can't read two paragraphs. And she's pounded out right here at seven and eight hertz, over three standard deviations. She could only read two paragraphs and she was done. Uh, so I entrained her using the blood flow model, the cerebral blood flow model, where 7.8 hertz had maximum effects on driving up cerebral blood flow. From a neurofeedback perspective, this would be a very bad thing to do very counterintuitive or, or very wrong to do from a neurofeedback model, which is a frequency model. So I gave her this exact model that she should not have, drove up her cerebral blood flow, and this was her 30 minutes later. And now she read 10 pages, 30 minutes later, giving her the exact frequencies from a neurofeedback model that she should not have. So it goes to show you don't have to use frequency to have remarkable effects on brain functioning. You can use blood flow, for instance. These are neurotransmitters liberated during fear. And during fear, serotonin crashes and norepinephrine skyrockets as you prepare for flight or fight. And that's a bad place to be. And that's, that's, a, very, a, that's a big fear reaction. This is cerebral spinal fluid levels done in the wintertime in, near Chicago by Sheely. And they found, and they were using uh, white light 10 hertz. And they, of course, wintertime people in Chicago would have high melatonin levels during the day. And they found that melatonin dropped 6%. But endorphins, serotonin, and norepinephrine all went up wonderfully. And I call this the Christmas brain, or it could be the happy birthday brain, but it's, it's celebration brain. Because think about this when you're celebrating. Let's say it's Christmas time or it's your birthday, and you're inviting all kinds of friends over. You're having fun. You're excited. Uh, you feel really safe in the moment, so your serotonin levels are high but you're also excited to meet all kinds of people, which has a, 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 a mild increase of norepinephrine. Not a huge increase like you would with flight or fight, but a mild increase. And this is an excited, very happy brain uh, right here, and I call it the Christmas brain. And entrainment does that naturally, which is partly why it has a nice calming effect on people. Here's lactate production, and lactate is a serious issue with uh, concussion or TBI of any kind, including viral infections. Lactate gets shut down in the brain. And this study here uh, by Sappy Mariner found that in a five minute span, lactate was driven up 260%. And I think that is partly the key why we have such remarkable results with our concussed uh, and TBI uh, population with entrainment. Now, they could be other things too, because typically they're not sleeping well either. And I'm sure they're 
their HPA axis is quite active and things like this too, because they're struggling with their lives. But I think this is partly what activates the glia and fires up the brain and gets it going again. And entrainment has remarkable effects on glia. Now, astrocytes produce and release lactate as a source of energy for neurons. So if lactate shut down, you're hooped. Lactate serves as an astrocytic signaling molecule in the locus coriolis, and that's the part of the brainstem that generates norepinephrine, which you must have if your brain is going to function. Just don't want too much of it. Just You want just a nice, excited level, like, like I am right now, probably, uh, putting on this webinar. Now, here is a study done on, uh, these are transgenic mice. Um, who, were all, who, were, who were bred to develop Alzheimer's. And they used, uh, in this case, gamma entrainment. And you can get gamma devices from us if you request a gamma model. Well, we could send you a gamma model. More and more people are actually using gamma with entrainment, even though there are no published studies at this point, really. Uh, there's going to be more and more clinical anecdotes. More and more clinicians are really liking gamma for uh, cognition and... Uh, uh, what's the word, reasoning and things like this. But anyway, in this study, it was used to control uh, beta amyloid. So basically, they had a group of mice that they put into a box. They gave them 40 hertz flicker with an LED strip in a box, a cart, uh, whatever, the cage that they were in, versus the mice that had no exposure. And they found that their amyloid deposits dropped by almost 60% in the same day. This is like four hours later, four to, four to eight hours later when they, uh, when they, uh, uh, section the mouse brains uh, and so on. They also looked at microglia because they want. They figured they were activating microglia to clean up the amyloid deposits. So they looked at microglia, and sure enough, microglia were much fatter now than they were with the control mice. The, the gamma mice were much fatter because they were full of amyloid deposits. And they also looked at how much microglia was inside the. Uh, uh, or sorry, how much amyloid was inside the microglia itself. And yes, they, they confirmed that they were fatter because they were containing microglia. Uh, so uh, gamma is remarkable uh, for what it can do there. Now heat shock protein is something very, very fascinating. I didn't understand it and I still don't really understand it entirely, I don't think, but uh, a, grad, a doctoral student did an H, HSP study um, back, way back in 2007. And, uh, and he was very excited when he saw these results. Now, heat shock protein is a type of protein that uh, builds up in our body when our cells are being threatened. And they call it heat shock because when the original animal studies that were done, they would take animals and slowly turn up the heat and turn up the heat till they're starting to cook them. And they noticed their cells would flood. Well, they were called, near, called cooking them, so I shouldn't have said that. But as they made them very, very hot to the point where it was distressing, the biology of the animal, they noticed that heat shock proteins, especially HSP70, would skyrocket as a protective mechanism to keep the cells from dying. But then they discovered later on that cold, extreme cold, would, would induce heat shock proteins, so did bacteria, so do viral infections. Any presence of a virus really drives up heat shock protein as the body tries to prevent the cell from being damaged by the virus or the bacteria. So it's important for immunity to have high heat shock, heat shock protein in your saliva and your uh, oral mucosa and your sinuses, you know, and in the brain too. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so in saliva, it's important for oral defense. Uh, it's on cells and so on to protect them and so on. And it's also a big part of the uh, immune response. Okay. Uh, it protects the brain from injury as well through multiple mechanisms medicine is experimenting with pharmacological uses of the you know, actual manufactured heat shock protein to try to use it for the treatment of brain injuries. Uh, heat shock protein uh, inhabits nearly all subcellular structures in the brain where they perform a whole variety of chaperoning functions including like other things and helping of unfolding of proteins and neuropeptide polypeptides and transport of proteins and so on. They're also been found to be high in malignant, in malignant cells, around malignant cells as they try to protect those cells or the malignant cells. And they're also, um, uh, depending on their intra or ex extracellular location, they exert protection against environmental stress and also can act as potent stimulators of the immune response and also are important for cancer prevention. So this was the study that was done by this doctoral student 
And he was using uh, a randomized entrainment again at about eight hertz. And he drove up sal salivary HSP70 by 184%. And so he was very excited about that. So those are some of the things. Now there's this recent cell study that came out by Singer and, and her group on exciting cytokines in the brain. And it's a very, uh, if you want a copy of that study, just email us or, or send an email to webinars at mindalive.com. And I can send you that study. It's a very in-depth, complicated study. But they're finding that, yeah, entrainment has remark. And again, they're using gamma entrainment, and it has some remarkable effects on, on brain cytokines, in mice anyway. So entrainment appears to relax the mind, yet it seems to stimulate the actual structure of the actual brain and all the supporting structures of the brain itself, including what I mean by glia structures as well as neurons. And so it's very exciting what entrainment can do. I want to thank everyone very much for attending. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege to have such a wonderful group of like-minded people who care about others and are trying to restore mental health to the masses of our societies.